When the Korean War broke out, the T-43 existed only as a full-scale wooden mock-up. Even worse for the T-43, various parties within the army were considering the cancellation of the T-43. The Ordnance Department redefined military characteristics on April 24, 1950, before the outbreak of the Korean War, which had made the T-43 a less relevant project. In the spring of 1950, the Army Chief of Staff General Joseph Lawton Collins was making published statements on the supposed imminent obsolescence of the tank, with medium and heavy tanks in particular. The earlier mentioned Ordnance Technical Committee member, U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Walter B. Richardson, would also reveal a three-way struggle within the Army to his fellow committee member of the Marine Corps, Lieutenant Colonel Arthur J. Stewart. This struggle between the infantry, armor, and ordnance branches was over the T-42 medium tank project, with the infantry desiring greater anti-tank performance from the 90mm gun. The Logistics Division of the Army had presented a study to General Joseph Lawton Collins, with the recommendation of cancelling the T-43, as the national war economy would have severe difficulties in producing sufficient numbers of heavy tanks to equal Soviet stocks in production. Additionally, it was also expected that the experimental heat ammunition of the T-42's 90mm gun could penetrate the armor of the Soviet heavy tanks. In September 1950, the Detroit Arsenal conducted a study to arm the T-43 with the T-15 90mm gun in a smaller turret. This new design reduced costs and weighed around 45 US tons instead of 55 US tons. The T-15 90mm was an experimental upgrade mounted on the M26 Pershing around 1945 in the form of the T-26 E4. The T-15 was a two-piece ammunition gun which could penetrate 6.2 and 9.2 inches at 1,000 yards and 30 degrees, with a muzzle velocity of 3200 and 3750 feet per second for the AP and HVAP rounds respectively. The US Army discontinued developing a Pershing with the T-15 90mm gun because of practicality reasons which limited the performance of the vehicle. This study seems to have been initiated by advocates of the 90mm gun with the Army staff, but the exact reason for this study remains vague, except to reduce weight and costs of the T-43. Although the Army Chief of Staff and the Logistics Division were in favor of canceling the T-43, various forces within the Army would see to it that the T-43 was ordered for production. The Army field forces were strongly opposed to the Army Chief of Staff for the following reasons. The 90mm heat ammunition was unproven, the heat round could easily be defeated by spaced armor, which reports suggested that the Soviets were using, the round would be inaccurate after a thousand yards, and even though a medium tank capable of defeating all enemy armor could be delivered, heavy frontal armor was still necessary to perform breakthrough or defensive operations. Lieutenant Colonel Arthur J. Stewart also used these arguments when he wrote to his superiors of the Marine Corps to solidify their support. This resulted in a letter from the Marine Corps staff on April 20th, 1950 to the Naval Planning Group that the Marine Corps had no heavy tanks and that these were needed to provide defense against enemy armor. When the Korean War began, the two lieutenant colonels also received support from the armor branch of the U.S. Army. Brigadier General Bruce C. Clark, the former assistant commandant of the Armor School and former member of the 1949 Army Field Forces Advisory Panel, which heavily endorsed the adoption of the T-43, had observed the Soviet buildup of forces in Europe while commanding a brigade in East Germany. He responded by calling for the immediate initiation of quantity heavy tank production. With the support of the Army Field Forces, Brigadier General Bruce C. Clark, and the endorsements of all the Army General Staff, the Army Chief of Staff had no other choice than to approve limited heavy tank production and the activation of a limited number of heavy tank battalions for evaluation in August 1950. Lieutenant Colonel Walter B. Richardson learned that just 80 T-43 tanks were approved for production, and urged Lieutenant Colonel Stewart to make the Marine Corps support of the T-43 project clear, so as to get more leverage for full heavy tank production. Three general staff members of the U.S. Army contacted Arthur J. Stewart, urging the Marine Corps to reveal their stance on the T-43. As a result, the Commandant of the Marine Corps wrote a letter to the Army Chief of Staff on September 15, 1950, to notify him of the Marine Corps requirement for a heavy tank, and he requested whether production was planned for a heavy tank and what the estimated cost would be. On November 7, 1950, a new designation system was implemented. Rather than classifying tanks by their weights in the light, medium, and heavy categories, the tanks were now classified according to their main armament. In this case, the heavy tank T-43 became the 120mm gun tank T-43. The Army staff confirmed their order in December 1950 for the production of 80 T-43 tanks. In turn, the Marine Corps confirmed their order of 195 T-43 tanks on December 20, 1950, which was later increased to a total of 220 heavy tanks, costing $500,000 each, worth approximately $5.4 million in 2019. 
An order of 300 T-43 heavy tanks was placed with the Chrysler Corporation by the U.S. Army and Marine Corps in addition to six pilot vehicles which were already ordered on January 18, 1951. The first T-43 was completed and delivered to the Aberdeen Proving Ground in June of 1951. The six prototype versions differed from each other in multiple ways. The sources only mention specific details on the pilot vehicles number 1, number 3, and number 6. These six pilot vehicles were also significantly different from the actual production vehicles. These differences in between the pilot vehicles included the main gun, sand shields, a pistol port, a ladder, muzzle brakes, and driver periscopes, among others. The first two pilot vehicles were made according to the initial drawings, and the other four according to early production drawings. The design of the final three pilot vehicles was carried out by Chrysler. The six pilot vehicles are essentially divided in two versions, the first two pilot vehicles and the later four pre-production vehicles, of which the last three, designed by Chrysler, were designated as 120mm gun tank T-43E1 on July 17, 1952. This was done because the differences between the initial T-43 pilot vehicles and the final three pre-production vehicles was large enough to obtain a new designation. Some key features of the pilot vehicles which were removed on the production vehicles included a two-armed gun travel lock, exhaust deflectors to prevent the suction of hot exhaust gases in the engine cooler, exhaust pipes from the personal heaters through the hole, and a track tensioning idler in front of the sprocket. T-43 pilot number one weighed approximately 55 US tons unstowed, and 60 US tons combat loaded. The vehicle was 22.94 feet long without including the gun, 12.3 feet wide, and 10.56 feet tall. The T-43 was an impressive tank to see. The tank was operated by a five-man crew consisting of the commander, gunner, two loaders, and the driver. The turret had two hatches, one for the commander and one for the loaders and gunner. The hull was a mix of an elliptically shaped cast, mild steel, casted by General Steel Castings Corporation, and rolled steel, which was assembled by welding. An elliptical shape is one of the most efficient ways to make a hull with maximum curvature across the front and sides, putting maximum actual armor where it is needed, the least angled parts of the armor. The armor is most vulnerable head-on, but the more the projectile hits to the side of the armor, the more effective the armor gets because the angling gets steeper. The extreme angling of the elliptical shape also makes it more likely for a projectile to deflect it if it does not hit the armor head-on. The front hull upper glasses presented 5 inches of armor at an angle up to 60 degrees vertically. This gave the T-43's upper glasses a minimal effective thickness 10 inches at every angle. The armor at the transition from the upper to the lower glasses was thicker than 5 inches. The exact thickness is not specified by the sources. The advantage of an elliptical hull is that the armor is highly angled at every point and gets more effective the more away from the middle the shell hits the elliptical shape. The lower glasses was 4 inches thick, angled at 45 degrees from vertical. So, the minimal effective thickness of the lower glasses was around 7.1 inches. The sides of the T-43 had an elliptical shape like the front of the hull. Both the upper and lower sides of the side armor presented armor equaling 3 inches. The armor of the upper glasses was angled at 40 degrees from vertical, which meant it presented around 2.3 inches of actual armor. The side hull lower glasses was angled at 30 degrees from vertical, which meant it presented around 2.6 inches of actual armor. As with the frontal armor, the actual armor was thicker at the transition point from the upper to the lower glasses, but the exact thickness is not specified by sources. The rear of the hull was not elliptically shaped like the front or sides of the hull. The upper rear armor plate was 1.5 inches thick at 30 degrees vertical. This gave it an effective protection of around 1.73 inches. The lower rear armor plate was 1 inch thick at an angle of 62 degrees vertical, which presented an effective armor of 2.13 inches. The floor of the T-43 was, like the front and sides, elliptically shaped. An advantage of an elliptically shaped floor is that it better deflects the blast of a mine because of its curved shape. The floor armor of the T-43 lessened gradually from 1.5 inches at the front to 1 inches in the center and half an inch in the rear of the hull. The top of the hull was 1 inch thick. The gun travel lock was located at the right of the rear hull plate. An interphone control box was located at the left side of the rear hull plate. Two storage boxes were located on both fenders, one large and one smaller. Two outlets were located at the upper right side of the hull near the turret ring. These were outlets for the bilge pump and exhaust pipe for the personnel heater. The T-43 had two pairs of lamps installed on the front of the hull. On the left side was a combination of a headlamp and horn, and on the right side a blackout lamp for convoy driving and a headlamp. Additionally, a blackout marker was installed on both sides. The driver was located at the front of the hull in the middle. 
The driver used a mechanical wobble stick to steer the vehicle, which was situated between the driver's legs. At his feet were the brake and accelerator pedals, on the left and right respectively. The horn button and primer pump were situated at his left, and a handbrake lever on his right. In front of the driver were a performance indicator, an instrument panel, periscopes, T-36 periscopes for the first four pilot vehicles, as well as a hand throttle lock. The seat could be tilted to the side and locked in place with the help of a lever and a clamp. Underneath the seat was an escape hatch for the driver, which was opened by pulling the hatch release lever after which it would fall open. The driver's hatch was a sliding hatch which would slide to the side when opened. Behind the driver was the fighting compartment, turret, and engine. The T-43 was powered by the gasoline 12-cylinder AV1790 5C engine. This air-cooled engine developed an 810 gross horsepower at 2800 RPM and a net 650 horsepower at 2400 RPM, which gave the vehicle a net horsepower to ton ratio of 10.8. The T-43 used the General Motors CD854 transmission, the same transmission that was used for the M46, M47, and M48 patent tanks, which had two gears forward and one for reverse. Combined, this power pack gave the T-43 a top speed of 25 miles per hour on a level road. It had a fuel capacity of 280 gallons, which gave it a range of approximately 80 miles on roads. The T-43 used a torsion bar suspension with seven road wheels and six return rollers per track. In addition, the T-43 had a compensating idler at the front of the tracks and a track tensioning idler in front of each sprocket. It had three shock absorbers fitted on the first three road wheels and two on the last two road wheels. The T-43 had 13 teeth and 28.802 inches diameter drive sprocket at the rear of the vehicle. The T-43 could either use the T-96 or T-97 tracks and had 82 track lengths per side. The tracks were covered by a small side skirt. The tracks had a width of 28 inches and a ground contact length of 173.4 inches. This gave the T-43 a ground pressure of 12.4 psi. For comparison, a human foot has an average ground pressure of 10.15 psi. The tank had a ground clearance of 16.1 inches and the ability to climb a 27-inch vertical wall. It could cross trenches of up to 7.5 feet wide, could climb a 31-degree slope, and forward up to 48 inches of water. The T-43 was able to pivot steer as well. The T-43's turret was a single steel casting. Like the hull, it was cast in an elliptical shape. The front of the turret was the most armored part, and the thickness gradually decreased from the front to the rear of the turret. The gun mantlet had a thickness from 10.5 to 4 inches at a degree from 0 to 45 degrees vertical. At its thinnest, this would give the T-43's gun mantlet a minimal effective armor of 5.66 inches. The front of the turret had 5 inches of armor at 60 degrees vertical, which gave it an approximate effective armor of 10 inches. As previously stated, the side armor gradually lessened from the front to the rear of the turret. The side armor lessened from approximately 3.5 to 2.5 inches and was sloped at an average of 40 degrees vertical. Pilot turret number 6 was tested by Aberdeen Proving Ground between September 8th and 17th of 1952. This was done by firing 120mm AP T116 ammunition, the ammunition the T-43 would use on the front with an average of 4.73 inches, and the frontal sides with an average of 5.25 inches, on the turret. They also tested 90mm AP T33 and 90mm HVAP M304 ammunition at the frontal sides with an average of 3.63 and 3.46 inches respectively. Further, they tested 76mm APC M62A1 and 57mm AP M70 ammunition at the sides of the turret with an average of 3.28 to 3.1 inches. The following observation was made. There were large differences in protection from a direct frontal attack as compared to a 30 degree flank and that this condition could be somewhat improved by a slight change in the turret wall thickness to increase its protection. The wall thickness decreased rapidly from the front to the side wall areas and could be much improved by making this decrease more gradual. The rear of the turret had 2 inches of armor at 40 degrees vertical, which gave it an effective armor of approximately 2.61 inches. The turret had 1.5 inches of armor at 85 to 90 degrees vertical. An armor plate was bolted on the turret at the gun's position to facilitate the removal of the gun. Additionally, an armor plate was bolted on the top of the turret in front of the commander's hatch and above the gunner. The backup periscope of the gunner was installed on the top left of the armor plate. The loaders in the gunner had to share just one escape hatch, while the commander had his own. The safety of the loaders and the gunners when they needed to escape the vehicle seems questionable to say the least. 
The commander was located in the rear of the turret, the gunner was located in front of the commander on the commander's right side, and the two loaders were located at the front of the turret, at both the left and right side. To accommodate the gunner's seat, a decrease was designed in the turret bustle, which can be identified by a weird bulge at the bottom of the turret. External features of the T-43 Pilot No. 1 turret included a pistol port on the left side wall, a ladder on the right side wall, a handrail on both sides, a handrail on the rear, a stowage rack on the rear, mounting for a jerry can at both sides of the rear of the turret, the protective blisters of the T-42 rangefinder sticking out on both sides of the middle of the turret, a ventilator inlet on the left side of the commander's cupola, two receptacles for radio antennas on both sides of the commander's cupola, and multiple lifting eyes on the front and rear of the turret. The commander's cupola is an interesting development of the T-43 heavy tank. The T-43 pilot vehicles received the same commander cupola as the M-47 Patton, but the production vehicles would receive the M48 Patton Commander Cupola, which was designed by Chrysler. This was smaller than the early type Commander's Cupola. It is unclear if the switch from the early type M47 Patton Cupola to the M48 Patton Cupola was carried out after the production of the six pilot vehicles, or if this was done during the production of the pilot vehicle, as the last pilot vehicle, pilot number six, seems to have the M48 Patton Cupola. It might be that this switch was already carried out when Chrysler took over the design responsibility of the final three prototype vehicles, but sadly, no vehicles of the pilot number 4 or number 5 have been found to give support to this theory. The T-43 pilot number 1 was the only T-43 pilot to be armed with the 120mm T-122 gun in the T-140 combination gun mount. Every vehicle produced after the pilot number 1 used the 120mm T-123 gun. The 120mm T-122 was a rifled gun barrel with a length from muzzle to breech block of 302.3 inches and the barrel itself was 60 calibers, or 282 inches long, the T-122 could handle a pressure of 38,000 psi. Interestingly enough, it seems that Hanukkah has made an error in his sketch of the T-43 Pilot No. 1 in his book, Firepower, A History of the American Heavy Tank. Hanukkah presents Pilot No. 1 with the muzzle brake of the 120mm T-53 gun, but without a bore evacuator. Since the later T-34 heavy tanks were armed with 120mm cannons with bore evacuators, it would be illogical for a gun of this size, and with the technology available, to not have a bore evacuator. In addition, a picture from the Fort Benning archive shows a sketch of the T-43 pilot design with a bore evacuator. What is interesting about the pilot number one is that it seems to never have had the actual T-122 barrel as it was intended. Instead of a muzzle brake and bore evacuator, it seems to have a counterweight. A reason for not mounting a proper T-122 gun might be because they never intended to test fire the T-43 pilot number one, because the T-43 would never use the T-122 gun. Why the T-123 gun was never mounted on pilot number one in the first place is unknown. It's possible that the T-122 gun was the only available gun at the time, and a prototype was needed before a T-123 gun could be supplied. The turret had an electric hydraulic and manual 360 degree traverse. Additionally, it also used electric hydraulic and manual elevation, with a range of minus 8 to plus 15 degrees. It took 20 seconds for the turret to fully traverse, and the gun could elevate 4 degrees per second. The gunner aimed the main gun via the T-42 rangefinder and had a T-35 periscope as a backup. The commander had a set of gun controls and was able to override the gunner and fire if necessary. In short, the T-43 had hunter-killer capabilities. Just two types of ammunition were developed for the T-122 gun before its cancellation. These were an AP and an HVAP shot. Both shells were two-case ammunition. The right side loader would load the projectile, and the left side loader would load the propellant and slide the ammunition into the gun breech. Before the gun could be fired, the left side loader had to step away from the gun and press the button of an electrical loading safety mechanism so it would not get in the way of a recoiling 6320 pound gun. The AP projectile and the propellant both weighed 50 pounds, which meant that the left side loader had to slide a 100 pound round into the gun breech. The AP projectile of the T-122 had a muzzle velocity of 3100 feet per second, which could penetrate approximately 7.8 or 8.4 inches of armor at 30 degrees at 1000 yards, depending on sources. The HVAP projectile could penetrate an estimated 14 and a half or 15 inches of armor at 30 degrees at 1000 yards, depending on sources. The maximum rate of fire was five rounds per minute, and the T-43 carried 34 rounds of 120mm ammunition. Additionally, the T-43 Pilot No. 1 could mount two coaxial 50 cal machine guns in the combination gun mount, one on each side of the main gun, and it carried 40,000 rounds of 50 cal ammunition. One of the 50 cals could also be swapped with a 30 cal machine gun. 
The electrics were powered by the main engine-driven main generator, which produced 24 volts and 200 amperes. An auxiliary generator was used when the main engine was not running. This auxiliary generator produced 28.5 volts and 300 amperes. In addition, a total of four 12-volt batteries were available, divided in two sets of two batteries. These batteries were charged by either the main or auxiliary generator. The T43 Pilot No. 1 used an AN-GRC3, SCR508, or SCR528 radio, which was installed in the turret. It had four interphone stations, plus an external extension kit. The vehicle also had two personnel heaters on both sides of the front hull and three 10-pound carbon dioxide fixed fire extinguishers and one additional 5-pound portable carbon dioxide fire extinguisher. The 120mm gun tank T-43 Pilot No. 1 still exists. The T-43 Pilot No. 3 was a little different from T-43 Pilot No. 1. The T-43 Pilot No. 3 was, for example, armed with the T-123 main gun and the T-154 gun mount, which could handle a pressure of 48,000 psi instead of 38,000 psi of the T-122, making it much more powerful. Its AP round could penetrate an estimated 9.2 inches of armor at 30 degrees at 1,000 yards, with a muzzle velocity of 3,300 feet per second. Its heat round could penetrate an initially estimated 13 inches of armor at all ranges at 30 degrees with a muzzle velocity of 3750 feet per second and later 15 inches. The T123 gun has an effective range of 2000 yards. The pistol port and side screws were removed on the pilot number 3. The sixth pilot vehicle was the Marine Corps pilot vehicle and was the last of them. This pilot vehicle was in contrast to pilot number 1 and number 3 designed under the responsibility of Chrysler. Some notable differences from the previously mentioned pilot vehicles were the M48-style commander's cupola instead of the early type M47 pattern one and the headlight guards. In the previous pilot vehicles, these were much more rectangular, but the headlight guard on the pilot number 6 was round. This shape would be used in all the production vehicles. Another distinct feature of the pilot number 6 was the T-shaped muzzle brake. What the Western Allies didn't know was that after the initial reveal of the IS-3 during the 1945 Berlin Victory Parade, the IS-3 super tank had numerous mechanical issues. The design had been rushed into production, which resulted in welds cracking open on the thick frontal armor plates. The suspension had issues, and also the engine mounts needed reinforcing. Large numbers of IS-3 heavy tanks were sidelined during an extensive upgrade program which lasted from 1948 to 1952. The IS-3 was produced until 1951, with a production number of around 1,800 tanks. In 1951, the British conducted a study of the effectiveness of the IS-3. In this study, they deemed that the IS-3 would have been more effective if it used either the German 88mm of the Tiger II or the 85mm D5T gun. The 122mm ammo was deemed too big and too unwieldy in the turret style of the IS-3. If one would compare the space of an IS-3 with that of a T-43 heavy tank, which achieved the maximum of 5 rounds per minute in a more spacious turret with two loaders, it could be concluded that the reload of the IS-3 and thus its effectiveness would be less than its T-43 counterpart. While the Western Allies were still building their tanks to counter the IS-3, the Soviets were already designing its successor. In September 1949, the first prototype of the IS-5, or Object 730, was ready for trials. Although the eventual T-10 would differ slightly from the IS-5 because of various improvements which were made during production, the first vehicles of this new heavy tank were put into production on November 28, 1953. The T-43 was the logical successor to American World War II heavy tank development. By building a lighter version of the T-34 heavy tank and using the most advanced techniques at their disposal when it came to steel manufacturing, it was truly a worthy successor of the American heavy tanks. The elliptical hole shape gave the T-43 better armor than the T-34, while weighing 10 US tons less. Combined with a 48,000 PSI gun, the T-43 seemed to be the way to go to counter the Soviet IS-3 tank menace. The problem is that the T-43 always seems to have been in a very tight spot, and even when the Korean War broke out, on the verge of cancellation. The first red flag would have been the ridiculous numbers that the army suggested it needed, a mass of 11,529 tanks for the US Army alone, and an additional 504 tanks for the Marine Corps. The second red flag was the division in the US Army on the T-43, which would eventually cause the army to drop out from bringing the T-43E1 to the T-43E2 standard and just go with the T-43E1 instead. The Marine Corps was called in to bring the additional leverage needed for full-scale production of 300 vehicles, while the Marine Corps only requested about 4% of the total estimated number of about 12,000 tanks needed. 
With the Marine Corps ordering the most T-43 tanks of the two branches, it can be suggested that the heavy tank developed by the Army and for the Army was in actuality now a heavy tank for the Marine Corps instead. In short, the Army was already very divided on the T-43 heavy tank, and thus the M103, before the first prototype was even built. Luckily for the T-43, enough leverage was given by the supporters within the Army and the Marine Corps to get the six T-43 pilot vehicles and the 300 production vehicles into production, six years after the IS-3 was revealed in Berlin and one year before the T-10, the successor of the IS-3, went into its first production run. But the future of the M103 heavy tank, albeit a troubled and extensive future, was secured by the supporters of the heavy tank in the Army and the Marine Corps. That's all for this video. Make sure to follow our website, we'll be releasing new articles on the regular. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or Reddit and if you use Discord there's a link to our community server in the description. Also likes, comments and subscriptions on YouTube are greatly appreciated. If you would like to help us continue to develop and expand, also consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be used to help us enhance and design new articles and features for you. Until next time, keep us in your sights.